So first off, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm also conscious of the fact that we are the only thing holding you away from lunch. So I undertake and promise to you that I will maintain tight grip on time and we will be done absolutely no later than quarter past one. So this panel is going to consider the changing nature of trade due to the rapid adoption of digital technologies in particular. Um, we will be looking at financial related professional services, but we'll also look more broadly for businesses at the challenges that cross-border data flows present for both policymakers and regulators. I'm joined by three of the most eminent people I know of in this space. Um, first off is Anne Cairns. She is the vice chairman, uh, executive vice chairman for MasterCard. And in that role, she represents MasterCard around the world, focusing on, in particular on inclusion, diversity and innovation. So exactly the right person from MasterCard for this particular panel. And then next we have Martin McKelvey. He's a partner at Freshfield, specializing in antitrust competition, but is now leading also Freshfield's ever-growing trade team. Uh, again, he, he and I have had a number of discussions about how his clients are starting to ask more and more um, questions and seek more and more help on digital trade. And so Martin will bring that flavor to our panel. And then last, but by no means least, is Hiroshi Matsura, who is Japan's, now I've been practicing this bit, Envoy Extraordinary and Minister Plenipotentiary in the UK. But most critically for this discussion, he was Japan's chief negotiator on the UK-Japan SEPA agreement, the free trade agreement in place between ourselves and the Japanese. So a wonderful panel, I think you'll agree. Let me start, though, with what we mean by digital trade, because in my experience, digital trade can mean one of three different things. Firstly, it can mean how we digitalize existing trade flows, which is something that industry agrees is critically important and where we're supporting government in any number of technical ways. But it is also, frankly, a little bit dull. So we're not planning to focus on that for this panel. Instead, we're going to focus on the other two aspects of digital trade, which are firstly, how technology is changing the way that trade works, and secondly, data transfers and how digital trade is regulated. Or, in fact, at the moment, largely unregulated. It's something of the Wild West of trade right now. We would like for this to be an interactive conference. So there is going to be a poll. Um, and I would also welcome questions from you, the audience, as we go along. I've been warned that you are a little bit shy and people don't particularly like to put their hands up with a question. It's a digital trade poll. You can ans ask your question digitally. It'll come through to my iPad, which is right here. The City UK have let me have an iPad of my own for this session. Um, so we will have a chance for questions and answers at the end. Um, but we are looking to have a poll for this one. Uh, and you can have any of the first round of questions in which to answer this poll. So um, the poll will be, which technology will change digital trade the most in the coming five years? Your choices are blockchain, artificial intelligence, the internet of things, additive manufacturing, and cloud computer and big data. If anyone is wondering what additive manufacturing might be, it's 3D printing. But the manufacturers get a bit twitchy if you call it 3D printing, so we'd call it additive manufacturing instead to make sure that they still feel they have a role in society. So without further ado, I'm going to move on to the panel discussion. And Martin, just to put your notice, my first question is coming to you. And I'd like you, if you would be so kind, to give us some context. We've spoken about the rapid adoption of digital technologies. How is that changing global trade? And how is it changing how you're thinking about trade? Sure, thank you, Sally. Um, I think it's useful to start by putting this in a, in a bit of historic context. We've been through several rounds of digitization uh, in markets, each of which has presented challenges and opportunities for market participants and regulators. So you think about the adoption of computing at its most basic. That profoundly changes how we gather, 
systematize uh, and interact with one another in markets. And you already see at that stage some of the regulatory challenges that emerge, which have more or less impact on trade, whether those are things as basic as hacking, security, etc. The internet, of course, revolutionizes this from the point of view of mass access to communication, to uh, the ability to gather much, much greater quantums of data that then become available for analysis. And that creates a whole set of new challenges for regulators that they have to deal with, whether those are privacy, competition, authenticity. Uh, and regulators went through a process of trying to re-understand how they think about markets in the context of those new challenges. So we now find ourselves arguably at the, in the midst of the third age, characterized by uh, algorithmic decision making, characterized by machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, driverless cars and phenomena of that nature. And we therefore see the regulators and businesses having to respond to those challenges. I was interested yesterday to see at uh, the, uh, the ABA conference in Washington, the competition regulators in the US indicating they are now going to spend a very large portion of their additional budget on looking at algorithmic collusion, for example. So we've got new challenges that regulators and businesses have to face into. So we're now at a point where the business model of many uh, of those in this room relies on, or at least is optimized by, the use and transfer of data across borders. And that presents, I think, an acute challenge for governments and regulators. Just think about the degree of control that they can have in a digital trade environment. Go back to physical goods and physical assets and trade in those. Easy to control, easy to tax, easy to regulate becomes more challenging with services, which is why you get sometimes quite elaborate regimes for regulation of services based on qualifications or otherwise. Now we're in a world where you have a commodity that is intensely easy to trade across borders and very difficult to control. And how do policymakers react to that? Well, I think there are a number of different ways. You can try to take back control to your jurisdiction, and Linda touched on localization in uh, the first panel session, and we will touch on it, I'm sure, more here. You can try to adopt uh, effectively extraterritorial regulation, and indeed competition law is a good example of that, uh, where the effect is outside the jurisdiction. You can still uh, take control of that and regulate it with the risk of potentially divergent outcomes in different places. Or finally, you can adopt standards that are whether explicitly or implicitly, intended to operate as a benchmark on a wider geographic basis. And GDPR is an excellent example of that. But you can also see it in things like the recent commitment secured by the UK CMA in relation to Google's privacy sandbox, absolutely intended to be a baseline for how Google operates in privacy terms across the world. How do I hear clients talk about this. I think it's fair to say they recognize that balancing of interests. It is absolutely clear that they want to be able to achieve clean, effective cross-border data flows to optimize their business. But they recognize that there are public policy imperatives that sometimes conflict with that. And what they ask for above all, I think, to go back to what Lord Grimston said, is consistency and predictability. We're in a world where the global rules or the bilaterally negotiated rules that govern all of this can afford more or less discretion to regulators and government. But managing that discretion in a rule-bound way seems to me to be absolutely central to what I hear clients asking for. Yeah, I, that's very much aligned with the experience I have with my own clients as well. So it's that's a relief, Confirmed. frankly. Good. <laughs> Confirmatory. Anne, I'm going to turn to you now because Martin has very much given us the challenges of data, but MasterCard is known as a business right at the cutting edge of digital and technology. Mm -hmm. So where are you seeing the value, the, the upside, the opportunity? Well, 
As we went into COVID, there was an absolute explosion of people using technology. And we around the world saw increase in e-commerce that we had never seen the like of in the last 10 years. Um, and what that was doing was it was giving access to small businesses, for example, the 6 million small businesses we have here in Britain, to be able to sell online and to be able to expand their business on a global basis. Now, then we come to the barriers that Martin's been talking about because so far so good on the e-commerce side, but how does actually everything flow around the world? I'll stay positive though, Sally. <laughs> let, me, let me talk a little bit about the recovery. Now, during COVID, here in Britain, we saw the turnover of the small business community drop by 30%. But it started to recover. And last year, 800,000 new businesses opened up here. That compares with over 5 million opening up in the States. And so I would say that what technology is doing right now is it's democratizing access to e-com. And that is the big, big shift. And people are getting very used to buying things online, um, from groceries to clothes to practically everything else. And it's not just through big suppliers like Amazon. It's through marketplaces. And I think the key thing about making this thrive is creating trust. If we can put things in place that make people feel, and I'm talking about consumers here, confident that what they have ordered will be delivered, and if the thing that they bought is not what they wanted, that they can return it, and that they can get their money back. And that is really what something like MasterCard does because we have completely global processes in place to handle this called chargebacks. Um, and it creates a level of safety and trust for consumers around the world. And that's three billion consumers in the case of our business. So these are the sort of positive things that have been going on in the last couple of years, and they're accelerating right now. And I'm really glad that you mentioned that intersection of goods and the services that you provide, because Martin, you used a word earlier when we were preparing service of yeah service third time lucky <laughs> serviceification. What is that exactly? I guess it's a world in which products that were previously delivered to you as goods. I mean, I can look back and getting my first edition of Microsoft Windows in physical disk form. Is that the one with the paper clip? That, you, are you that old? I, I, I fear so. I fear so. <laughs> uh, and now here I am, for better or for worse, I'm subscribing to Microsoft 365 online that's delivered digitally to me. That, that is a home example, but it, it goes very much to uh, the subscription model that we see for goods and services nowadays, to even to the extent now where uh, aircraft engines are delivered effectively on a subscription model, that you, you buy or you rent the service and the engine rather than paying for it up front. That has consequences for making digital trade much easier and expanding it massively. It also creates, of course, a lot of additional data. Uh, which then can be used across borders, can be analysed, and with the AI revolution, the insights that you can get from that are going to be so much deeper. So there is a whole raft of consequences from serviceification. Again, one of the reasons why governments are interested in making sure that that is done in a way that, as you said, and maximises trust mm -hmm. uh, and allows them to maintain control. Hiroshi, it feels like now is a great time to bring you in because of Japan's astonishing reputation for high-end, high-value-add manufacturing, which, from what Martin has just said, it feels like that's an absolute area crying out for sensible digital policy. So 
Could you just explain to us how Japanese policymakers are looking at digital trade? And, and if you could use some examples in manufacturing to blow these guys, financial services guys' minds, that would be brilliant. Sure. The, the similar exciting changes happening in the ground of uh, manufacturing in recent years. For example, the industrial robots are increasingly controlled digitally from the, the headquarters using the remote communications sending data, receiving data, and also even the uh, repair and adjustment of the machinery in the factories are remotely controlled using digital. We experienced the sudden disruption and uh, the resurrection of the supply chain through the COVID uh, seasons. So that facilitated the uh, sort of nimble, uh, agile, flexible uh, control and uh, realignment of the supply chain also using the digital. But maybe the, the, to, to, to make the deter of the, the sanctions, companies may uh, resort to the, such uh, flexible realignment of the supply chain as well. So that the, the, the data is, the, the free flow of data is a prerequisite for, for such a, a industrial control nowadays. So the data is, is blood and the digital is, the, is its circulatory uh, system. Now, the, the, the journey of the, the digital, digital trade policy of Japan goes back to the beginning of the 2010s. And of course, at that time, the, the industry use of the digital hasn't, uh, the, hasn't reached the, the present day <coughs> stage. But um, we knew that the something radical uh, will be happening to the uh, business use of the digital in the coming days. And also, we knew that we need to uh, quickly uh, set the global rule, um, which allows the, the free flow of data across the borders, so that we shouldn't choke the so unseen potential of the, the, the digital application to the business. So, so we started our journeys, and we negotiated uh, several uh, trade negotiations uh, with digital chapters, including Japan, UK, you mentioned Sally, and also the, the Japan-US digital agreement, and also CPTPP. That's the, the, the best example of us. Also, using the, the fora such as G20 and G7, we adopted the, the, the digital free flow with trust concept back in 2019. And last year, the British presidency took the lead to adopt the, uh, the G7 digital trade principles. So that was the good. Uh, this one has been the race uh, to be ahead of the time, but uh, at the same time being chased by, by the time. Now we are, uh, are facing two challenges. One is the, the creeping digital protectionism or digital nationalism mm. uh, at some uh, quarter of, of the world. They want to have the increasing sovereign control over the data and the technologies. If that tendency is unchecked, uh, exactly that will choke off the uh, uh, the digital activities of, of, of the businesses. The second one, the second challenge is, is that uh, we have learned that the bilateral arrangement is, is not enough uh, to help the, the companies, uh, the flexible management of the, the, the data network which uh, cross the borders. We need to have the, uh, uh, the something bigger because the real strength of the digital information lies in the fact that it doesn't know the borders. It can go all the directions simultaneously in nanosecond speed. So if data can move freely only to a limited number of the countries which has a bilateral arrangement, that uh, the efficiency of the business is far less than the than, than optimum. So this is the, the challenge we are facing. Anan, I see you nodding there. Is that? very much aligned with your experience, or have you had other frictions and challenges? Yeah. No, you know, I completely agree that it's got to move frictionally cross-border, and, uh, and I think it's pernicious the way that countries are now saying, uh, I want to keep all of my data on soil. I understand, you know, the thinking behind some of this, but, uh, but I find it a bit strange to use terms like on soil when everything's up in the cloud these days. <laughs> Yeah, okay, maybe you can have your own cloud. Um, but uh, but the, the issue really is that global trade is global trade. Yeah. And it's super inefficient and full of friction unless you can actually move frictionlessly across border. And we know that it's very fragmented today and that's the real problem. 
but we are, you know, in the internet age, and I, and I honestly believe that by adopting global standards in the same way that we've done in the consumer space for the card networks and introducing them in the trade space, in the B2B world, we can build technology in a distributed way all over the planet that would be interoperable. We know how to do it. And in fact, we're going to do it through blockchain. That will happen. And I, you know, I think blockchain will change the world of trade and many other parts of the world as well. But it's not just the platform that a, a blockchain that is going to be revolutionary. It's the applications that are going to be built on top of that. When you think of blockchain, the next thing you think of is Bitcoin. And, uh, and Bitcoin is just something that uses blockchain. But blockchain is, is much broader than that, of course, we all understand. And I think that kind of technology, together with 5G, and you talked about moving at nano speed and so on, that's all going to happen. And that's why we have to, say, in Britain, have the infrastructure we need to be a fantastic global player. We need to invest in not just our broadband, but our 5G, our quantum computing, our AI. And most of all, we have to get our small to medium sized businesses digitized. And that's why the government here are rolling out the Help to Grow program through <coughs> Bayes, uh, which I'm the non-executive director of. Terrible name dropping, Anne. A terrible. <laughs> and that's a reminder to everybody. We have a poll question of which um, blockchain is one possible solution, a possible tip from the panel as to what you might vote for. A reminder to vote on that. And also a reminder that you can ask questions at any point in time. Martin, I saw you looking at me. That's either going to mean you want to come in or that you're terrified I'm going to ask you a follow-on question. I'm not sure which it is. Did you want to... Can I say something just to bring the points from the two of you together? I... I think your point on data nationalism is a really important one, and it's at one extreme of the spectrum. Perhaps there are still countries who adopt, let's call it the, the Chinese internet sovereignty rule, or people who want to put things back on the soil because it benefits local, local businesses more than others. In many other cases, though, you're kind of on this spectrum of public policy choices, and many of those public policy choices go exactly to your point, Anne, on trust. Mm -hmm. Because one of the drivers of trust, is, well, one of the drivers of trust is clearly your ability to manage the process properly, get refunds and returns, etc. But also to have your data properly protected. Yeah. And this goes to the central question of privacy. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge there is that is a much disputed concept. You can have very different mm -hmm. conceptions of the value of privacy as a public good. You can see, I'm not, it's not fair to call it an extreme necessarily, but one view of that in the EU where privacy is a fundamental right, expressed by the court to be a fundamental right. Quite a different approach in the US, where it is probably somewhat further down the list of public policy priorities. And the UK arguably sort of trying to straddle the two of those now, as it goes out into the world, moving somewhat away from its previous centre of gravity in the EU, and now trying to make uh, agreements on a much wider basis. Those disparities are reflected in turn in the trade agreements that are signed up, which have a more or less permissive, and to go back to what I said before, a more or less discretionary approach to the restrictions that are allowed on free data flows, very often because of a different perception of the importance of the public good like privacy. So we can all sit here and say, yes, we want unfettered data flows, but to, if we want to build trust, we have to acknowledge that there will be different versions of that in different parts of the world. And that is exactly where you get to the challenge on creating multilateral agreement. Mm -hmm. And why we end up with a bias towards bilateral or plurilateral agreement, mm -hmm. where you can kind of get a meeting of minds, or at least some lawyerly drafting that covers over the difference. Yeah. Fancy a lawyer advocating <laughs> lawyerly drafting, what a shock. Um, I am going to come back to the multilateral landscape in just a minute, but 
You mentioned specifically US attitude to privacy, which is very much one of if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, so what's the big deal, as opposed to the EU much more stringent approach. Hiroshi, this is very unfair of me because I haven't asked you that I was going to ask you this question, but would you feel able to give us any sense of the CPTPP Asia Pacific approach to privacy, which, which always feels to me to be kind of much more moderated and moderate, but it, is that right? Well, I think uh, we have to, to uh, um, uh, we have to strike balance of the sticking to, to the national sense of privacy and to strike the, the deal with uh, broader uh, members of the international community, so that the CPTPP level is is just adequate yeah. yes, to yeah. encompass a large number of the the countries, but also uh, have the uh, important security over the the sense of national. Uh, privacy. Thank you. I'm sorry, I, very unfair of me to ask you that question. I'm very grateful that you took it. Um, but I am going to stick with you now. On, on that multilateral level, it feels to me as though the, the World Trade Organization and other international bodies could be doing more in the digital trade space. You know, we've spoken about the fact that different countries have different approaches and that getting those to, to gel is next to impossible. So what are you seeing at that supranational level? What are you seeing at the WTO, for example? Yeah, sure. As Anne said, uh, the global issues needs to, to find a global solution. And the WTO is exactly the way uh, we can find those, those solutions. Now, the Japan, Australia, and Singapore initiated the uh, e-commerce negotiation at the WTO, WTO back in 2019. And we had made some important progress uh, to set the, the global rule, including uh, 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 consumer protection and uh, clear governance, transparent governance, etc. But for the for the most important uh, element, such as the the, the free data free flow or beyond the borders, we haven't reached to the agreement yet. So we have to intensify the the negotiations and uh, to put uh, additional impetus. Uh, from outside, such as the, the successful bilateral uh, agreements and uh, regional agreements, such as CPTPP, as a building blocks to the uh, WTO negotiations. Now, uh, we are striving to reach uh, convergence on the main points toward the end of year this year among the 86 countries which are participated in, in the negotiations. But we are seeking for global and multilateral solutions, which means we have to expand that the convergence to the agreement and the consensus by the general membership. So it, it's, it's some way to go, but this is the only place in which uh, all the companies of the, all the, the countries can have the, the full potential to, to use the, the digital uh, application of the business. So we, we should strive for it. By the way, Japan and the UK are fully in sync with each other toward this, uh, uh, toward this goal. Thank you. Um, I've just had a message from the organizers to say that the poll question didn't come up on the screen and to remind you to access it via the QR code in order to vote and that we will display the question and results on the screen later. So if you haven't voted, I will track you down and find you. <laughs> so please do vote now. Um, we've also got a number of questions coming through. It's not too late to ask a question, so please do feel free to do so if you wish. Um, but while you're thinking about what fascinating questions you wish to ask, my next, my next question is going to go to Anne, which is we've very much spoken about digitalization of trade and business models, but what we haven't really spoken about is data flows as they go across the border. And what... Fascinating. Um, what, are, what products and services do you see as being particularly international and particularly... Have we lost the mic? I think we have. Can you hear us okay? Are we shouting? Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to shout to Anne and hope that she can shout back <laughs> to me. Um, International data flows, are they of importance to MasterCard? And where do you particularly see those as being important to you? Well, they're hugely important to our business because um, MasterCard's in 200 country, over 200 countries around the world. 
um, and a huge amount of the business is actually built on cross-border flows. Um, so, uh, and, and that's something that we've seen. I, th I think my mic's working, back, isn't you're it? Back on. Yeah. That's something that we've seen accelerating over the last few years. Of course, there have been headwinds during COVID that have affected these things, such as what's happened in the airline industry, travel across border for consumers and all these kind of things. Um, and we're, we're currently seeing things like travel starting to recover in some respects, <laughs> I suppose if you're not in Manchester Airport. Um, but but uh, and, and that is why we, you know, we firmly believe in setting global standards. Now, this thing about data becomes very intrinsic to this. And so we have been developing global standards around data to try and help exactly the things that you talked about um, with the World Trade Organization. To think about data and say, what should be the rules governing data on a global basis? And it's things like the consumer should have control over their own data. The good news is that the latest technology allows the consumer to provide things like consent. Whereas previously in the more, um, in, in the more fragmented world, that was much more difficult to do. The consumer should decide what level of privacy they want. Um, companies should deal with consumer data in an absolutely transparent fashion. Consumers should understand what's happening to their data. Companies should be responsible for protecting that data to the level that the consumer decides they wish to have protection and so on. Now, admittedly, it's going to be a combination of governments and business that will ultimately agree and decide on these things like these global rules. But I think this is the, this is the thing that if we could decide, then it will change the way that we do trade. It won't just be the technology that makes this happen. The technology is the enabler the discussion and the agreement about the global rules, and it may be the WTO, but I actually <coughs> believe that it will be something much deeper in the business world between consumers and businesses and governments in terms of what's acceptable in level of trust that will ultimately determine what the world looks like in this space. Thank you, Anne. Keeping going with the whole concept of um, data flows but frictions associated with them. Martin, we've, we've talked a lot about trust and privacy. Are there any other barriers for trade in this space that you particularly like to highlight or flag? I mean, it depends a bit on which parts of the, of the digital trade package you, you, you focus on. We could think about, for example, digital products like software. Uh, where there is currently a moratorium on customs duties being applied to those, but that is under some pressure. Uh, in places, the consensus on that is becoming yep. a bit shaky, uh, with some countries threatening to, to impose duties on that. We could think about infrastructure that's necessary for the delivery of data across borders, where we begin to see companies insisting on onshore provision. But I think the most important part is still this point about data localization, which which is a, a real frictional cost for companies who are operating on a multinational basis. Now, in each of the free trade agreements that we've talked about, you get, you get the principle that we all believe that this is a very good thing. People shouldn't adopt unnecessary restrictions on the free flow of data. And then the question is, how wide is the exception to that that's been agreed? Is it an exception that is essentially discretionary for the government in question? Or is it one that seeks to impose at least some degree of objectivity? So a good example is the UK and New Zealand free trade agreement, which at least tries mm. to require the government to have a good objective reason for putting in place a restriction on the free flow of data. And that, I think, is what we should be aspiring to, to manage this balance between trust and other public policy goods and the clear economic good that is the free flow of data. 
And uh, so, Sally, yeah, could I just it. sort of say, I think, you know, one of the things that we haven't touched on is artificial intelligence. And of course, you know, that thrives on data. Um, and if you think about it um, from the point of view of our business, we process about a billion transactions a day, maybe, you know, taking swings and roundabouts, 100 billion transactions a year um, around the world. Um, the peak's about a billion a day. Um, and it's very important for us to be able to look at those on a real-time basis and see whether any fraudulent activity is going on in the blink of an eye. In order to do that, we must deploy artificial intelligence to look at those transactions and make that decision at a blink of an eye. That's how the payment flow works in the world today. And in order to do that, you need to have data. Yep. Yep. So, so the thing is, everything that we expect to happen in our daily lives is happening because of the free flow of data to a certain extent, because you can deploy artificial intelligence and because you can make decisions so quickly. And that is at a time when artificial intelligence is in a very narrow spectrum. Mm. It's just checking in things like fraud. The things artificial intelligence could do in the future when it becomes general artificial intelligence are massive. And so countries and companies and governments who actually work this out and be able to actually engage in the system more actively are going to differentiate themselves. And this is going to create, well, a many different speed world, just like we have today. But it's something we should be definitely thinking about for the future. And on that future looking note, I'm going to draw the panel discussion to a close. I hope we're able to see the results of our poll now. If we're not, we'll move on to audience questions. Yes, we can. So, Anne, your um, comment on blockchain being of particular intelligence, and then perhaps your later reference to artificial intelligence has definitely um, brought those as the two most popular answers. <laughs> Didn't influence everybody. They did. <laughs> but also, also down there, the big data point. Is that what you were roughly expecting to see? Well, I was. I was. I mean, I think, um, you know, the Internet of Things is a facilitator of all of these things, if you like, but yes. And, and Hiroshi, just picking on you briefly, to what extent do you think policy objectives from governments are aligned to those particular pieces of technology? Well, it's... it's <laughs> Well, as, as Anne said, the, all the technology has uh, um, the big potentials, which we haven't seen yet. So it, it's difficult to see through. But uh, what I can say is that uh, artificial I intelligence can be always empowered by the cl cloud computer computing big data for any application for, for the business, and particularly for the, the manufacturing purpose using the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. But the, I think for, for the policy point of view, Internet Things is now facing a sort of crossroad because the, the, the application of Internet of Things to the manufacturing is, is fine and it will be uh, growing more and more. But the application of Internet of Things to the, the households Absolutely. and the, the private lives will make infringement to the, the privacy of the, the citizens. So that will be a uh, subject of a uh, big policy discussion from now on. Thank you. So I'm absolutely gratified by how many questions there are from the audience. I was desperately worried that nobody would have any questions, but in fact, we have probably more than we can handle. So I'm going to move on to that part now. Um, Hiroshi, I'm sorry, the, next, the first question I'm going to do for you, um, and it's around cybersecurity and infrastructures. It's, is cybersecurity infrastructure keeping pace with the development of digital products and increased data flows? Are countries opening themselves up to new threats from malign global actors? Now, I'm not asking you to breach any Japanese security points here, but, <laughs> but anything you can tell us on how you're seeing cybersecurity in particular would be really interesting. What, uh, what I would say is that cyberspace is enormously free, mm. unless the, the government uh, try to restrict that, that freedom very hard by digital protectionism or the domestic regulations, but it's almost impossible to uh, 
to, to control that, that freedom. So that means whatever the trade, trade policy, digital trade policies, everybody is exposed, highly exposed to the, the, the cyber attacks. And the, the proper response to the cyber attacks is, is defense, which is dedicated for, for that purpose. And the trade policy doesn't facilitate or doesn't uh, give uh, additional exposure to, to the, the cyber attacks. But what I would say is that if many countries associated with the, the liberal uh, digital trade regimes and the free uh, flow of the data, then the, the number of the countries associated with it is, is growing, and then the, the community of, of countries will, will be there, which has the stake and the interest in having the, the safer uh, cyberspace, which would be good for, for the world, I, I, would, I would say. Thank you. And I'm just going to check, Anne, Martin, did you have anything you wanted to add on cybersecurity? No, no obligation at all? Well, I mean, it's, it's a massive area and an incredible investment in the financial sector, as we know, and increasingly so. Um, and I think that um, the only way to keep ahead of things is to have multiple, multiple layers of cybersecurity. And we all know that hacking is occurring at an increasing pace. And... Uh, and of course, the hackers go after um, the weakest link. Um, so I think, you know, if we think about our SME businesses across Britain, um, while I was talking about digitizing them, we also have to give them cyber tools to protect themselves. And that's the talk, sort of thing that we think about in our industry because we actually build some of these things. Um, and they're very important. Martin, the next one is for you, and it's lifting it away from very specific points yep. to a much broader point, which is that the, the day started with an opinion that globalisation has stalled. Number one, do you think that's true? And secondly, do you think it's having an impact on digital trade in particular? Do I think globalisation? I think globalisation is going in a different direction to how we might have predicted just a few years ago, but the impetus from business uh, to, and from the consumer to be able to operate on a business on, on a basis that does not recognise borders, I think remains very strong. Now there are clear constraints in that. One has to say that Brexit has made that more difficult for UK consumers and UK businesses, uh, and we're kind of in the mode of trying to find ways round that at the moment. But I, I come back into Anne's point about trust to the extent that consumers trust being able to shop across borders then they will continue to do it. And as we get new modes of delivery, uh, then that makes it a lot easier to do that. So from a consumer's point of view, bumps in the road, but I think that is, that is an unstoppable train. Uh, from a business point of view, I think there are material headwinds around supply chain resilience, for example, that are making that more challenging at the moment. But the fundamental economics of it, I think will probably reassert themselves. Any, anyone want to, if you want to come in on any of these questions, do feel free. But otherwise, I'm going to move to a question, I think, probably best for you, Anne, mm -hmm. which is that speakers noted the digital trade is improving SMEs' access to opportunities in the UK. How can we help bring more SMEs, in particular in the developing world, into the global digital economy? This is a great question for me, because <laughs> at MasterCard, we actually have committed to bring the next 50 million SMEs into the financial system around the world. And, um, and actually, in the normal course of business, about a third of those would be women-led. But, um, but we've been having a conversation about we need to level the playing field between men and women in the business world. So we're actually going after 25 million women-led companies, which I'm pleased to say. Get that little piece in. Um, so... First of all, you have to connect them digitally. So you can't have financial inclusion if you don't have digital inclusion, so that's the first thing. I would say what's becoming increasingly important are, and we're talking about it all the time, things like digital identity. It's not pervasive yet, but we've seen it in different forms, actually, as we've gone through COVID, haven't we? Um, you know, we're producing QR codes for ourselves as we cross borders and so on. So that's a key area to think about. And then it's things like working between the public and the private sector in each 
country to say, you know, what is the infrastructure of the country? What are the needs of, you know, the different businesses around the world? And what is the government doing to actually help those businesses to thrive and grow? And which partners in the financial sector do you have to work with? Well, not just the financial sector, but the, you know, many different sectors. And what we found is that a combination of global companies and local companies coming together with governments have probably been the most effective. And if you can actually link, it, uh, link things up in a way that, um, that you're benefiting things like um, power generation through clean energy. So, for example, we're working with um, a company that... Uh, that in Africa called MCOPA, where they just produce a solar panel that can go on a roof, that can generate electricity, that we can work with a phone company to pay for on a pay-as-you-go basis, and we put the financial technology in there, people can run their businesses with that in Africa. So this is a combination of all of those things I've been talking about. Well, can I? Please do, yes. yes. Uh, well, I to um, <clears throat> curb the digital nationalism or digital protectionism of the developing countries, I, I agree on that the, the best way is to empower the business, speak to the government, uh, open the, the policy space to, to change the, the, the policy. But to, to make it happen, the business of the developing countries themselves to have to, to see the interest in, in, the, in the free uh, data flow yeah. and uh, the, the global management of that data by themselves rather than benefiting from the, the digital protectionism. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> We're at time. Uh, it's just flown by for me. I'm sorry to all of the audience members whose questions we haven't been able to answer. Perhaps we can pick them up over lunch if people are, are staying. It's been an absolute pleasure. I would like to thank my three panellists, Anne Cairns, Martin McElwee and Hiroshi Matsura. I believe that the last thing to do now is to send you off in the direction of lunch and to thank you on a personal level as well for your attention and your interest. Thank you.